title of my presentation is What's Wrong with the Bedroom Tax? Um, somebody pointed out earlier what's right with it. I think it's worthwhile as starting with looking at the justification behind the imposition of the bedroom tax, um, the areas of justification for this, and where the Scottish Government feels this measure doesn't really make sense, certainly in Scotland and, and for much of the, the UK. So, first of all, what is the bedroom tax? Well, it was initially um, termed the social sector size criteria. And the reason it was termed that is because the um, rules which are due to be brought in from April in terms of the number of bedrooms that somebody is in, uh, entitled to with housing benefit um, came into operation in the private sector a few years ago. And so DWP are bringing this in in the social sector, hence the social sector si size criteria. It was later termed the under occupancy deductions, which then became the bedroom tax, and DWP are now spinning it as the spare room subsidy. Um, either way, any way you look at it, it's to do with um, deducting housing benefit from people deemed to be under occupying their homes. So, um, one of the most common areas that I hear um, being brought in to justify the bedroom tax is that housing benefit is out of control. This graph here shows you the last 10 years of housing benefit expenditure in, UK, in, sorry, in Great Britain. It excludes Northern Ireland. The green line at the bottom is Scotland. The one above it is London. The red one is England. The purple on top is Great Britain. What this shows is the differential in, in increases in housing benefit expenditure. Um, a better slide, though, is if you take inflation out of that. This is what's happened in real terms of the last 10 years when you discount inflation from those rises. As you can see, the gain at the bottom, Scotland, London, England, Great Britain. First thing to note here is housing benefit is not really out of control and it's certainly not out of control in Scotland. But also, I don't want to put across the point here that agrees with housing benefit out of control being um, a justification for bringing in measures to deduct housing benefit because housing benefit is a symptom and it's not a cause. If housing benefit is growing, it's because more people are claiming it or people it because of the recession, because more people are in unemployment or claiming benefits. That's why you see a spike in it around 19, uh, sorry, 2007 8 where the recession kicks in. Interestingly, over the last 10 years, of the um, increase in housing benefit, 93% of the increase is due to increase in England, and of that, 31% is due to London alone. In the social rented sector, which is the focus of the bedroom tax, the increase in real terms of the last 10 years in Scotland has been 6% over the 10 years. That is less than 1% per annum increase. It is certainly not out of control in the social sector. Now, um, Margaret Burgess, the Minister for Housing and Welfare, will be speaking later on. She and I met with Lord Freud about three weeks ago to put some of these points across. In addition to housing benefit being out of control, which um, I hope shows you that the, in Scotland that's not the case, the um, charge is put that it will save money, it will solve overcrowding, it will encourage mobility. The Scottish Government has done some analysis. Um, when you take everything into account, including the amount of money that will be saved on the welfare payments, um, you need to take into account, um, as a result of that, the amount of money that is then taken out of the economy. Overall, from the imposition of this measure in Scotland alone, £110 will be taken out of the economy. That includes the savings that will be made by the UK Government from this measure. In terms of solving overcrowding, it's a sledgehammer to crack a nut in Scotland. 6% of households are overcrowded, 18% of tenants will be affected. In terms of encouraging mobility, in addition to the 77,000 households of the 105,000 due to be affected that will need one bedroom properties, there were 23,000 homeless applications last year. Under the new rules, they would also, which would also require one bedroom properties. And yet, last year, there were around 20,000 lets of one bedroom properties. There's a mismatch of 80,000 households there in terms of the availability of one-bedroom properties in the social sector and the numbers that will need it. It will not encourage mobility within the social rented sector. These are the facts. 
It will affect 105,000 households, as I said earlier, 18% of all uh, social housing households, of which around 8 out of 10 contain an adult with a recognised disability. It will hit 16,000 families with children. It will lose an average of £50 per household per month. And if no one moves and no one reconfigures the households, it will lose up to £65 million in housing benefit. That housing benefit is also being taken from, by its definition, some of the most vulnerable people and families. Now, one of the um, justifications that Lord Freud put to us was that it's only fair because these measures are already in place in the private rent sector. And Murdo is going to give you a bit more information on that, and I won't go into that for that reason. Suffice to say that the comparison in my mind is very disingenuous because the two sectors are there for fundamentally different reasons. For a start, in the private rent sector, that is one of the few levers you've got to control the housing benefit that is paid out. In the social rent sector, there is an allocations policy and which that allocations policy is determined on priority need. The two sectors are there for very different reasons. It is not, um, it is not fair to uh, compare the two like for like. Now, DWP's answer to the various difficulties that people will get into is called discretionary housing payments. Um, and as they've dubbed it, they, this will be for the hard cases. Now, by their own analysis, Scotland and London have the same numbers of people who will be affected by um, the under-occupancy deductions or the bedroom tax. But next year, Scotland's set to receive £10 million in housing payments compared to £56.6 million for London. I should say that the discretionary housing payments are not just for the bedroom tax, they're for all housing benefit losses. However, when you look at it against the backdrop of up to £65 million in housing benefit being removed, you can see the mismatch in what's going to be available in Scotland compared with um, the amount that's set to be lost. Um, now, we, uh, the Scottish Government's been asked to uh, fund the differential. An important point of law here is that local authorities, by law, can only top up that DHP budget by about 2. Point, by 2.5 times. What that means is in Scotland, that could be to a maximum of 25 million next year, which is still about 40 million pounds short of the amount of housing benefit that could be lost. I'll hand over to Murdo now, and then happy to take questions afterwards. Um, my name is Murdo Matheson, I work as the Campaigns Manager for Shelter Scotland um, and I think um, conscious of doing these kind of presentations, obviously there will be some people in the room with a, a great deal of knowledge um, about the issues that we're talking about and others uh, maybe less so. So we thought it would be useful just to give a kind of overview of, of, of some of the facts. Many of you will know this um, and, and if that is the case please, please excuse us. And then after this I think it's very much over to yourselves uh, for a discussion and, and um, can I see where we, we go from there. The, the uh, presentation we were asked to talk about um, wasn't just about the bedroom tax, it was about uh, both that but also the crisis um, in housing. And I thought it was useful, um, to certainly from, from our perspective as an organisation, um, to give a sense of, kind of where we are in terms of housing in Scotland um, just now. Um, if you take a snapshot, so September uh, last year, there were uh, over 5,000, 5,301 uh, children living uh, mainly in temporary accommodation, temporary flats, uh, but also hostels, but uh, a small number um, in, in bed and breakfast accommodation as well. Um, on an annual basis, last, in, uh, last year we've got figures for um, over 35,000 um, households uh, accepted by their local authority um, as being homeless. Um, in terms of the, the supply of social housing, uh, over uh, 157,000 households um, on local authority waiting lists. Now that's purely local, local authority, uh, doesn't take into account housing waiting lists, although obviously there will be some, um, well many, many people uh, who would be on both. And if you looked at how long um, on the basis of, of uh, you know, properties becoming available and people moving into them, um, if nobody else went on to those local authority waiting lists um, and we started now just moving people into properties as they became available, it would take seven years uh, to, to clear those lists. But of course people come onto the waiting list uh, all the time um, 
uh, and, 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 and regularly. Um, over 1.8 million families and, and properties in Scotland that are, are classed as being in disrepair. Um, and this, this last figure, 51-year um, low in the number of uh, new homes built, isn't social housing, but is, is, is in, uh, in all housing in Scotland. So um, the construction um, industry, um, certainly, certainly in the doldrums um, just now. So the next um, slide is fairly basic, and I'm sure many of you will know this, and gives just a definition. So from April, uh, tenants in the socially rented sector of working age have a proportion of their rent liability cut um, if they're deemed to have spare bedrooms beyond their household need. Most of you will be aware of the figures. I think an, an important point to realise there is it's, um, I read the Sunday Herald yesterday and um, talks about you know, the, a percentage cut in, in the housing benefit or housing benefit being cut. That's not the case. It's of the rent liability. Um, and in many instances, that will be, not all, but many instances, that will be um, a, more, a more significant figure. So that's the definition of, of, of what we're talking about. We then look at uh, who is affected. So the estimates in Scotland, we've got 105,000 tenants affected. That's 20% of all tenants in social housing in Scotland. It's very difficult to know how many of those people will fall into arrears because we don't know what people will do. We don't know um, exactly everybody's financial circumstances. We don't know uh, whether, whether people would be able to, uh, to find money to make up the shortfall um, from, from elsewhere. COSLA um, estimate 40%, um, and that's you know, probably as good a, a, an estimation um, as, as we will be able to, uh, to come up with. And again, I think Jamie talked about this, about the, uh, the lack of, of supply we have. So even if we could move people into uh, property with the right number of bedrooms, as, as we're being told, uh, they, would need, they would need to have. In Scotland, we couldn't do that. 60% of those under occupying uh, need a one bedroom <laughs> home to move into. But in 22 um, local authorities in Scotland, there just aren't enough one bedroom, uh, one -bedroom homes. So, so we're then unable to, to, to move them into social housing. Um, so the question then, where, where do people go? Well, we're unlikely to be talking about people who will be able to buy their own home. So the only sector then available to people uh, is the private rented sector. Um, and if you look at uh, the cost of renting privately, um, the, the average rent is much higher than the average rent in the social rented sector. We did some work and looked at the average rent for a one-bedroom uh, property in the private rented sector uh, set against the average rent for a two-bedroom property in the social rented sector, uh, which is essentially what we're talking about here. And we found um, that it was, it was over £100 a month or £100 a month more. And these people will still be claiming benefit. They won't be claiming housing benefit, but they'll be entitled to claim local housing allowance. Um, and it will still be a, a cost, um, a cost to, 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 to government. Um, so you know, the, the, the cost savings are um, certainly debatable. Um, we did, I'd say, some work. And it wasn't just Glasgow we looked in. These are, I don't know, they may be slightly too small, the text, for you to see properly. Uh, but it's the weekly, the average weekly uh, rent. The, the red figure is in the private rented sector. The black figure is for a two-bedroom house um, in social rented. And in each, in, in each city, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Dundee and Inverness, um, cost significantly more average rent. One-bedroom property in the private rented sector. There's obviously lots of ideas for, you know, we've, we've talked today a lot about mitigation and, and ideas about, you know, what we can do, how we can try and address this um, and help, help tenants as they go through this. Um, ideas, you know, we've heard from Jamie there, but ideas from the Scottish Government, funding for advice services, uh, suggestion that social landlords share best practice. Some of you may be aware of the, of the stuff in, in, in Dundee uh, and looking also into to bedroom definition. Um, Govan Law Centre's proposal, um, which uh, last, last we checked when the petition ended, had over 5,000 signatures on the Scottish Parliament's website, uh, looking to amend the 2001 Housing Act uh, to stop or to make it um, or to stop um, uh, social landlords evicting for arrears when those arrears were accrued under under the bedroom tax. Um, the Shelter Scotland, we've um, you know written to, to, to Scottish ministers mm -hmm. um, and suggested mm -hmm. that they put in place 
Um, firstly, they call a summit of all registered social landlords in Scotland uh, to try and agree a common approach uh, to, what we, to, to, to how we, what we do and how we help people who do accrue arrears under this. So that um, you know, you, what the action that is taken against you if you go into debt and your housing costs in one part of the country isn't different uh, to, to, to that that would, would happen somewhere else. Um, and the basis of that as well, asking for the Scottish Government to put to, uh, forward a fund of up to 50 million so that the debt that this is going to put in tenants isn't automatically just transferred onto a social landlord and they're left with a, 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 um, a, a deficit um, in, running, in running their business. And the third thing that we're asking for the Scottish Government to do is um, issue guidance and intentionality. Um, at the moment, if you present to your council as being homeless, one of the, the things that they will look at and whether they have a, a duty to, uh, to help and to house you is whether you made yourself intentionally homeless or not. Um, one of the uh, criteria that can be used and, and is used uh, to say that people made themselves intentionally homeless is if they have been evicted for arrears. The argument being that well, you shouldn't have run up those arrears, um, you did, and therefore you made yourself intentionally homeless. Um, to our mind, and, and uh, I think to most uh, right-thinking people's minds, if those arrears were nothing to do with you, um, and it was a, it was a, uh, it was um, arrears accrued because your, your, the level of benefit you received was cut, then it's clearly unfair that people find themselves um, in that situation. So some ideas there, uh, obviously different responses to them. Um, some of the, the, the campaigns um, that, that um, are kind of around and you're, you're hearing people talk about, obviously the demonstrations um, this weekend, this Saturday coming up, uh, people will be aware of that. And also information on just kind of local campaigns and things that are happening on the, the No to the Bedroom Tax uh, website that I'm sure people are aware of and will probably have a discussion about after this. I think the final point I want to make before it opens up to what you have to say, which is, is much more important, I think, than uh, what, what we've had to say here, is just to go back to the original slide that I had. Um, you know, the bedroom tax has been given the name the bedroom tax. It's caught the public's imagination to some extent, certainly caught politicians' um, expectations, uh, expectations, imaginations, um, and the media uh, uh, as well. But it's not just about that. There are other issues. So she speaks social landlords deeply, deeply worried uh, about direct payments, um, tenants for the first time potentially um, getting, getting money coming into their pocket. Um, and making sure that, they, they, that uh, that money actually goes to the landlord and people don't, uh, again, uh, accrue arrears um, through, through a situation they didn't ask for. The overall benefit cap in terms of the cost of, of temporary accommodation, uh, local housing allowance being linked to um, CPI and basically the, increasing at a lower level um, than, than RPI. And for us, the other big issue that I started off talking about on housing supply, um, you know, we've, we've got a situation now in Scotland where everybody uh, who's, who's, who's um, accepted as their councillor as being homeless uh, has the right to permanent housing. What we don't have is the permanent housing to actually give them a home. Um, and all of this um, can, can, to some extent, be mitigated if we start uh, funding uh, the building of social housing properly. Um, and I have to say that in the, uh, the current CSR, compared to the last one, we've seen a, a cut of 40% in the budget for, for building a, a affordable housing. So thanks very much, and back to our facilitator. Thank you. Right, lots of points for debate there. You know, um, the housing waiting list, discretionary housing payments, um, the money that's going to be lost in Scotland, the def definition of what we mean by a bedroom. Um, you know, lots and lots of things to be focusing on. This part of the workshop is now over to you. We're looking to hear, you know, thoughts and feelings on these issues, any examples of good practice that's going on and any actions that can be taken to move this issue forward. Um, should be a roving mic available. <laughs> and can I see some hands for questions? We don't particularly have an appetite for evicting people because of the bedroom tax. Certainly not something that we're keen to do at all. Um, I know from SBHA's point of view, we're working with the most vulnerable that are going to see the impact of this come April. And today, I'm happy to say we've moved 47 households out of the 500. Um, and we'll continue to do what we can. But we're also aware of the fact that come the 1st of April, there's a lot of people that just cannot pay that money. And it's not that they don't want to, they just physically cannot pay the money. So I just wanted to get that point over that some of the RSLs don't particularly or won't be a victim because of that. 
Shelter Scotland, I think you're right in the fact that we are, we are very scared of the direct payments, um, what impact that's going to have on us. The bottom line is we don't have one bedroom properties to move people to, that's another issue for us. And also for the fact that we can't look at, I get your point on the definition of bedrooms, but from our point of view, a lot of our business plans as of most RSLs are better built around the impact or the revenue we're going to get in for, for the size of our properties. So we start looking at defining bedrooms as smaller, we're going to have to reduce rents where we're already, I'd like to say, one of the, the most affordable rents in Scotland, SBHA. So it's about the impact that's going to have on us being able to provide services at the end of the day. So if we're not getting these payments in, how do we therefore provide a business and how is it sustainable and viable? So I just want to be able to get that point over from an RSL's point of view. Thank you. There's a point um, over the back. No, it's, it's so everyone can be a problem. Mine's is actually a comment. I had a really, really happy childhood, a fantastic family, a large extended family on both sides. And one, no, as a child, actually, I was a child, but I had a very, very, observ I was a very observant child. And things actually got to me when I, from a very young age. And one of my most earliest memories, actually, at primary school, uh, a family came and the boy was my class, I remember his name, John McClure. And John was really quiet and he had loads of brothers and his mum and dad lived up the road, just we were in a hill, Lee Side Road. It was a new so it was a village actually, and it was a new street, Lee Side Road, Mill Hill Avenue, and new social houses. And I remember actually being seven years old, eight years old, one I remember it was a Friday, coming home from school, and there was John and his wee brothers standing on the street and all their furniture was there. And I remember actually coming about Glasgow, my father did a milk run for my uncle and everything. I remember actually from being a small child, passing homes actually with people's furniture out in the street. It's a really, really strong memory. I remember the troubles, watching the black and white television. I remember loads of things. I think that's what makes me the way I actually am. I think it's disgusting actually. I don't think we should be debating even these issues. It should be just banned like the fellas should be put in a box. I actually think it's a war in the womb. It's a war in women. Women, actually, I am 54, I've got two sons, 31 and 32. I lived in rural, my husband was a gardener and tied houses for the landed gentry, worked for the Jewers, whiskey the lot. I've seen cars and garages wrapped up with blankets, actually, central heating and all the rest of it. Um, I had a social house the first time in my life, actually, my husband ran away with another woman, and I actually commuted between Scottish borders and Ayrshire for a year and a half trying to get a swap, and couldn't get a decent swap, actually, because I had a really beautiful house, and great for a family who's next to a school. I've had six house moves in the last six years. I've no grandchildren. And I really do think it's a war in women. I know at 54 years old, actually, to be a woman, actually, the, to be a daughter, a wife, a mother, a friend, an auntie and everything else. And I know the trouble I had bringing my children up, actually, in rural poverty. And I had a tied house with no rent, no wood bills, no fuel bills, we got free fuel, we got free tatties, we got free, we got sheep actually, and we got pigs and things in the freezer. No, seriously. Yeah. It's actually a war in the womb, actually. It's a war in the family. And I think actually it's just disgusting. And I, I, I just don't know, actually. Women have enough on their plate, actually. We're expected to be all things for all people. When are you going to take it seriously, actually, that can families and people actually matter? No, it's really a disgusting tax, and women are going to bear the brunt of it, and that's my call, mate. Oh, yeah. So, a point about the gendered impact of this potential change. Climbing, there was a point for you. Ross. Sorry. No, it's Sorry, okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll come back to you. Sorry, okay. Hi, um, I just kind of wanted to make a point that was um, discussed in um, the earlier workshop that I went to um, about financial inclusion and financial exclusion. Um, and one of the quite, who talked about mitigating um, solutions is that, um, although I think that all of this should be scrapped, as most people in this room seem to think, but in terms of direct payments, one of the things that Grand Central Savings are doing, um, and it's something that, you know, maybe credit unions um, I know it's not in banks' interests to do it, but it, it would be interesting to see is that they're ring-fencing that money once it comes into people's accounts um, so that um, people aren't worried too much about budgeting for that direct payment um, and they're ring-fencing the, um, the housing benefit and the council tax benefit as well um, so that people kind of know 
that that money is not for spending. Um, so that's just kind of a really practical thing. Um, and I was talking to Jackie Crop, and she said it's really easy and simple to do. It's a really simple solution for people, um, but it's just kind of getting that beyond just Grand Central Savings. So just a point there. So that's a point about a mitigating potential action for the direct payment coming in in October. Uh, hello, my name is John Maguire. I'm a disabled gentleman and I'm being affected by the bedroom tax. I currently live in a two bedroom property uh, with Glasgow Housing Association and although I'm disabled and do need carers to on occasion stay um, overnight, I've been told by uh, Glasgow City Council that uh, I have to put, a, there's an extra room allowance that you can get from Glasgow City Council, uh, but one of the criteria is you have to have a carer who stays in your house a minimum of three nights per week. <coughs> now, I don't have a particular carer that stays three nights per week or can, uh, can um, you know, put down that they will do that. Uh, but what I do have is uh, various carers, more than one, who spend one night each, perhaps, like that. But the extra, I was wanting to speak to the gentleman from Shelter, uh, whether they know anything about this extra room allowance uh, with Glasgow City Council. And is there a way that I can put that down as having various carers uh, staying? Do you know anything about sure. that? I'm, uh, I'm not a housing advisor personally, so I, I can't can I give um, individual advice. But what I will do is I'll speak to you um, after this and I'll get you in touch with one of our housing advisors um, on our, our, our advice kind of helpline. Um, and they'll be able to speak to you. And um, if they don't know, they'll be able to find out. So. I'll stand up. I need to see past Susan. Yeah. Uh, my name is Anne Lynch. I'm an anti-poverty campaigner. I have been for 32 years, would you believe that? And the only difference is these poverty has got worse. You know, somebody mentioned earlier on from the top table about a cumulative effect. We're concentrating on the bed bedroom tax. It is very grave. It is very grave indeed. indeed. One week today, our people and the length of breadth of this country, it possibly will be facing eviction, or they'll be in terror, terror, at looking for this extra nine up to 16 pound a week of metal loads of them. It's just shocking. But also one week today, disability living allowance will be abolished as we know it, and it'll be called PIP, personal independence payment. This is another car crash coming, believe me. This one terrifies me. The top rate of DLA will probably pretty much stay the same, i.e. people with severe, severe disabilities will still get personal independent payment. Unfortunately, the lower and the middle rate is going to be abolished and the biggest majority of people that get DLA are on the middle and the low rate. And unfortunately, again, you will lose the bus pass. That bus pass is like gold. If you've got mental health problems, physical disabilities, or you're on a very low income, that bus pass can be a lifeline for getting out the house, going to visit Gran, going to visit your family, going to be run down to Balak, up to Open. It's a fantastic thing. Most people will not be able to afford the £4.50 per day to get out the house to maybe alleviate their mental health. That is another car crash that's coming. That terrifies me when that happens. But also universal credit is happening in April the 1st. I'm long-term unemployed. I've been on a gyro for 12 years now. It's a very unpleasant experience, believe me. In April the 1st, till next year, we're going to be reassessed. We're going to be reassessed. We will need to get 90 minutes on a computer to do our new benefit assessment. The biggest, we get one hour in our local uh, library. Lots of my mates don't know how to open their computer up, never mind use a mouse. So that is going to be very problematic. Also, if you've got uh, literacy issues, that's going to be a huge problem. The biggest thing, and I really did welcome Nicola Sturgeon's remarks at the weekend, I'm not a member of any political party at all, but I did welcome her remarks in relation to this. My big worry is the housing benefit getting paid direct to us, the tenant. It's not that we're irresponsible, but see when you're in poverty and you're living £71 a week, and my £300 a month rent, comes to my house and I've got a sister that lives in the southeast England 
and I might have to use that money to get a £150 return train fare for Glasgow to the South East to see my wee sister. There's no choice. No choice whatsoever. There'll be other people with universal credit that might have an alcohol addiction, might have a drug addiction, might have significant mental health problems, or might just be in plain dire poverty. And see getting that rent paid to us direct, it is really irresponsible for this government to do this. Just keep my rent, send it to my housing association. I don't want it. I want to know that I will always have a wee flat. It might be freezing and damp, but at least I'll still have that flat. Back to the bedroom tax. This is grave. This is absolutely grave. This isn't going to happen. The biggest majority of people will not be able to afford this. There are some people who, no matter what, they're just going to pay this extra £10 or this £40 a month. See the biggest majority of your £71 a week. You will not, it will be inhum inhumane to ask them to pay that. This tax must be axed. It's got to be axed. Now, I know that sounds a bit pie in the sky coming from this end of the floor. It's not going to work. We're going to end up with people getting eviction letters and people getting thrown in their houses. And I'll tell you what, all my pals from Chapel and East Roots and Parkheads and Gorbos and my family that live in these areas, there's no way people like me are going to stand back and watch your cousins, your sisters, your grandparents getting evicted out their flats because they can't afford to pay a condemn bloody tax. It's not going to happen. And I would just ask people, ask the difference between the bedroom tax and the poll tax is with the poll tax, they could take your furniture out of your house. And we organised to make sure they did not take your furniture out of your house when it came to a pending. But the bedroom tax is qualitatively different because they can take your house off you. And that ain't going to happen in this country. That just ain't going to happen. I would urge people to go a March the 30th demonstration, which is this coming Saturday, half past 11 at Glasgow Green. Then we're marching to Glasgow George Square. There's going to be a whole host of speakers, including Aye. people with disabilities and community oh, activists. Yeah. So come to that. It's a start. It's a start. They'll need to ask this bedroom tax. It ain't going to work. We're not paying it. Lots of points there. Um, um, some of the points about literacy issues, numeracy issues, the digital um, changes. Is there any points the panel want to come back on any of them? I, I don't know. I, mean, I think, to be honest, uh, probably similar to the last time we did the workshop, I, a lot, most of what people are saying we don't really disagree with, you know? Um, and I, I suppose <coughs> what would be interesting would be um, if people have kind of experienced of, of things that are happening in their own areas or, or things that they're doing uh, that might be useful to kind of share, um, with, you know, to allow us to kind of get something out of this um, moving forward and, and kind of construct it. Is there any examples you've heard about in shelter that you think could be replicated in our areas? I think, that, I mean, I, I went to a meeting, um, I think you were there at the STUC a couple of weeks ago, which uh, we were there and obviously somebody from the Law Centre, uh, just talking about their, their kind of local campaigns and things they are doing. I'm aware of stuff in Stirling and, and, and various other areas. Um, so maybe just people sharing that would, would, would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any examples? I know Clemmy spoke earlier about the one on and the Grand Central Savings are doing. Is there any other examples of things happening in local communities, things uh, social landlords are doing or steps social landlords are taking? Yeah, point up the back there, thank you. Hi, I'm Aidan Tyrrell. Uh, I'm doing some work with Pollock Credit Union and a number of social landlords on uh, working round about mitigating the effects of universal credit. You know, I think we have to accept that it's probably happening. So we need to kind of work on how we can help people manage the effects of it. Um, as, from an RSL's point of view, um, we're just basically trying to work as best we can with the local communities. We're doing a lot of work with kind of your churches, which I think they've alluded to before, about how we can help kind of community groups um, and going to, out to nurseries and schools and deprivation areas, just highlighting really uh, the impact it's going to have, particularly around universal credit. It's starting to educate people now, although we know we've got a 
some time to, to, to prepare for that. Um, it's about how we can educate people about going into monthly payments, and um, how they are going to learn to budget their money. Um, we, are, we have a Help With Money project, which has been hugely successful, um, and we're hoping to secure further funding for that, but it's about where we can get the funding to do that. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on in communities, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. There's a lot of people pulling together and, and trying to work as best they can. Um, I mean, universal credit is coming, there's no, no doubt about that. It's just how we can help tenants to, to better manage their money um, in the hope that they can afford ultimately to pay their rent and not lose their home. Hi, um, I've got a chronic illness and I said to the council, I'll downsize to a two bedroom, two bathroom houses because I need two toilets. And they said they haven't got any. So why should I be penalised because they haven't got a house to move me into? Someone else wanted to ask a question? I think it's all fine and fair and well, and I understand how you're talking about looking at um, helping folk manage their money and that, but let's be realistic, the folk with the bottom of the pile didn't have any money to manage. They didn't have anything. They're barely scraping by. I'm running about getting folk food parcels that's not enough to keep them. So that's how they're living the new. So the minute this house, uh, bedroom tax comes in, they didn't have the option. They're seriously talking about having to give up their bedrooms because they've got a lot of their houses. So they want to feed their family, and it's a terrible thing to say. It's heartbreaking sitting out there working with folk like that, listening to their stories that folk are actually talking about, got their local authority and handed their bairns there, but they love their bairns and want them fed. There's no other options for folks. And now everybody should just go against it, let them all be flung out their houses, fill the courts. For everybody, the first person that's got to get evicted, everybody go and stand outside their houses, and that's what we we'll have today. We have to go and protect everybody because it's just a joke. I'm just so lucky I have my own house, God's sake. But I've not got an orphanage. So, yeah, suggestions for different direct actions that can be taken. Any other suggestions? Uh, Paul Davis from the Dundee City Council. Uh, looking at some of the stats that you brought up there on the, the fact that it's cheaper to keep people in two-bedroom houses with registered social landlords rather than have them in one-bedroom private. Has there been any representation made to upwards to the Scottish Government or to the UK Government to say, look, you'll actually save more money by keeping people in two-bedroom registered social landlords uh, housing? And also, um, whether there's any knowledge out there about what proportion of people this would affect if the Government was to be able to make an amendment and say, Two bedroom properties are exempt. Seems a fairly simple solution. The short answer is um, yes. Um, when Margaret Burgess and I met Lord Freud three weeks ago, we put all those points across, including pointing out that in Scotland, because of the building or, or sorry, the policy of a minimum two bedroom build, we said would it not be reasonable in Scotland to have two bedrooms as a minimum? Um, and his answer was elusive, but it was along the lines of, if you choose to adopt a different policy direction, then you should pick up the bill for that. Now, that, that's a nonsense because the trouble is, is you can't magic up one bedroom properties in the next couple of weeks. It would take years to build them if we wanted to. And the point I was making is, um, housing benefit being uh, a reserved matter, is a one, so that the policy is one size fits all that's aimed at specific parts of the country. In Scotland, we don't have the symptoms that they're um, looking to solve from these cuts. Um, we don't have the availability of housing stock to move people to. And as Murder rightly points out, um, where do people go? Um, if at best they go to the private rented sector, if there's places available which cost more. Although it's called local housing allowance, it's still housing benefit. It's just called a different name. So in those um, statistics I put out, and the charge that um, housing benefits out of control, um, in, in the last 10 years in London, the private rented sector has risen by 232%. Um, and you compare that with the social rented sector in Scotland rising by 6%, which, el which is out of control. It's 
It's always seemed to me at London, London has actually created the problem. But you can know, maybe Lord Foy should actually, there's over a million. I remember watching a program years ago, it was a guy actually designed for government, actually, he was the Homes Minister, actually, and he resigned from Westminster because of this. And there was a Channel 4 documentary, but I haven't got a television, but I saw a bit of it actually. There's over a million empty council houses. In fact, Greenock, there's a whole. It's like Green as a whole estate empty, Castle Park and Irvine, there's a whole thing. But there's a simple solution actually that over the million social houses that are empty in the UK that are sitting boarded up and security guarded and metalled up actually, open them all up and create apprenticeships for all the youth. And I'm sure it would save a hell of a lot more money actually. The money they're spending implementing these stupid taxes and you know, all the rest of the things they're doing with welfare reform actually could be reinvested in actually opening up these boarded up houses and create apprenticeships for our young people actually so it's actually all I'm going to say it's bullshit. So suggestions on you know housing stock and us a potential solution yeah yeah. It's Who's targeting these private landlords with their 24 and 124? So, yeah. They're paying tax. Wider, wider issues about, you know, the regulation in private landlords and conditions people are living in. And again, I think maybe any, any other housing issues that people want to bring up might, in, and also any other solutions. We are in, going into the last few minutes of this workshop. So, if there's people who want to speak who have not had a chance to hear from, please come forward now. I've had six I mean, there's definitely a lot. Yeah. And I'm coming across people in South Asia that actually, that actually taken slums because they don't have to pay deposits. And I've been two or three houses actually people have asked for my assistance, and I went and sat with them because God blessed them. They're ready to kill their souls, and the slums are living in them because they're taking houses actually because they don't have to pay the blooming deposits. Another estate, and yeah, if people and come to their door looking for the rent, they don't the rent battle them. I know that Shelter have done some work it's around deposit schemes recently. Oh, I know, absolutely, absolutely. Some of that. We, we're doing, um, as a Scottish government, quite a lot of work in the private rent sector, and um, obviously we've now got a tenancy deposit scheme in Scotland, so deposits are held by a third party, so if there's a dispute at the end of the tenancy, somebody uh, can arbitrate on it uh, properly. We're also uh, doing some campaign work just now on security of tenure in the private rented sector. So, you know, the moment if you rent privately, um, you know, commonly after your six month, you're going to a month to month contract, it's the only se uh, 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 sector where your landlord can, for no reason, just come and say, that's it, I want you to move out. And we are kind of arguing that we should be moving towards a, almost a more kind of European model of renting. So I'll maybe, I'll maybe talk to you uh, after the, 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 the session. So, any Um, we represent South Asia Council and um, there's been a 25.2% rent increase in the last four years in South Asia. Taking it that the um, benefits will only increase at 1% um, for the next three to four years, if those, um, the, the rent increases continue at the rate they've been increasing, the 14% or 25% that people will have to pay towards the rent is really going to be even worse than what we think it is. I don't know about the private sector, I can only say for the local authority. So yeah, another potential issue to, to be looking at. Any other final points? Okay. Um, well, I'd just like to thank everyone for their contributions and thank our panelists, Murdoch and Jane. Thank you.